Good evening, my friends, liberty.me and otherwise. Uh, looks like this, this seminar got a lot of uh, very interesting promotion before it began. So uh, I think we're probably going to get a lot, of, a lot of people here, if not live, and certainly in the rebroadcast. So welcome. And I hope you had a wonderful New Year's and one lovely holiday. And it's so interesting to me how the New Year really is a chance to kind of, you know, it's a cliche, but you know, you, uh, the slate is clean, you know, you let go of the, the, uh, the mistakes you made from last year and even some of the successes and move on to an, a new year. And that's what we call it. That's why we have these resolutions. Um, maybe I'll get a chance to read through some of those resolutions I, uh, for that, that I had made for last year. I noticed how I went through them. They're pretty interesting because they were written right at the beginning of the year when you do have a sense of, you know, you know, idealism and optimism about about your life and all the things you're going to accomplish and the ways you're going to see things in the new year. And rereading them at the end of the year, you think, wow, uh, I didn't always adhere to those things this year. And um, some of them I noticed, because I, I had to do a real, a real uh, uh, personal sort of taking stock when I read them because there are things like, you know, treat every uncertainty as, as an opportunity and 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 greet uh, you know coercion with peace and hate with love and th this kinds of things. I mean things I actually believe, but I haven't practiced so well this year. And I think a lot of it comes down to it. I was trying to figure like, well, why? How did my mood change? You know, in, in 2015, how did I begin with a sense of you know wild ebullience and 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 hope for the future, and then fall back into a uh, a kind of, a, a, I don't know how else to put it, but a kind of a grumpiness, you know, about about um, the world of ideas and the world of rhetoric. And I think I think fundamentally, uh, for me, what's what's affected me in 2015 is the rise of Donald Trump. I don't know how else to, to tell you, um, uh, but that, in a summary, is it. But it it would be misleading to say it's all about Trump as a person. That's not the problem, you know. Guys like him, you know. They're, they're everywhere, whatever. Somebody posted on my Facebook the other day that he would just be another, another um, you know, ignorant, angry white man. His brutal problem is his followers, and it's true. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the Trump movement and what it represents for the future of liberty that has shaken me in a way. And I think, actually, it's adjusted my perception a little bit on um, concerning the problem we face. Um, uh, you know, in terms of the, the future of liberty. I, I suspect that I have always carried it around in my mind that a, a kind of model, now this doesn't mean it's explicit, doesn't mean that we go around preaching or that we adopt it consciously, but it's a paradigm. We all have a paradigm in our heads, like here's how the way, here's the way the world works. And this was my, uh, my, my, my paradigm I've, I've had for most of my life, which is that there's a, uh, the problem of liberty really comes down to a struggle between uh, the, the largest group of people uh, that constitute the social order who, um, for the most part, want to be left alone and to care about their lives, self-managing, and a power elite that, for whatever reason, has tricked uh, people into acquiescing to the, to the rule. So the problem is, is, is the elites and the masses are good, you know? Now, this is a very simplified model and um, there's aspects of it that are true, aspects of it that are untrue. But it's a simple model and I think it's generally the way I've, I've tended to read history and read the present moment. But what we've seen in 2015 was the rise of a genuine populist movement that uh, I would not call it a leftist movement. I think it's it's more um, obviously a rightist movement um, uh, in the sense that it's it's aggressively anti uh, anti organized left, right? So um, and it's and it's very appealing uh, to the petite bourgeoisie, and uh, I mean it's shaking everything. I. I I've heard other people say this, and I wonder if it's true. I tend to think it is, <clears throat> that Trump has fundamentally changed everything about American politics and uh, led to a kind of an upheaval within the Republican Party. I mean, his lead has been uh, substantial and dramatic ever since the summer when he first sort of blasted out onto the scene and dared to 
say things that the political elites in this country have, for the most part, kind of kept under wraps, you know? Um, yes, there's always been appeals to racial rhetoric. I mean, you can read the history of the Republican Party and see that, yeah, you know, there's the Southern strategy, you know, there were openly racist appeals and uh, there, were, there were racist appeals in the past, they were very rarely open. They've usually taken other forms um, until Donald Trump came along and then it just became, the dog whistles became no longer dog whistles, but actually, actually outright, you know, audible. Uh, whistles and it, uh, you know, attacks on on immigrants and basically, his whole campaign has been designed to find scapegoats for people's economic troubles. That's that's essentially what's going on, and uh, it's changed. It's always some other some of the other scapegoat. I mean, it's first it was the Mexicans, then it was China, then it's trade, and then it uh, more recently it's you know ISIS and and God knows what you know just you know, all forms of immigration from all over the world, anything to kind of find a scapegoat and, and, and promise to save you and me from the bad foreign thing, which is harming us. And you'll notice in, in Trump's rhetoric, he, he's actually not anti-government. He doesn't, uh, you know, obviously he makes no appeals whatsoever to kind of the free enterprise and liberalism and the power of market economy. I mean, that's not even part of his worldview. But more than that, uh, the old the old Republican rhetoric about, uh, about beating back government, cutting government, getting government out of the way, eliminating regulations, letting the market take care of everything, like you used to get from Reagan. I mean, all that is just completely gone in his paradigm. I mean, he's, he's an, a, an open and aggressive authoritarian who, manage, who imagines that he can run this gigantic big government mixed economy welfare regulatory interventionist military state through the force of personality and individual expertise. That's what Trump really represents. But what's striking is that it's working. It's working for him. And it's for the first time, I think in my lifetime, I've seen a mass movement among, I guess you could say, you know, core population groups in this country, um, namely, um, Middle class, white, evangelicals, uh, towards a really radical and very dangerous, unthoughtful, sort of marauding uh, political movement that is rooted in uh, faith and authority and a loathing of the other. And it's really, really shaken me. I have to just tell you, it's really shaken me. I mean, you know, and it causes me to make a further distinction in my mind. You know, uh, the masses, the rabble, the the hui puloi, the you know the the petite bourgeoisie out there. Uh, you know, it's an awesome group of people in terms of uh, management of their churches and their families and as consumers and individual decision makers. Peaceful, wonderful people, capable of building up a social order in exactly the way Bastiat used to talk about, but. Um, but their their ideological predilections, once they're weaponized in the form of a political campaign, can be uh, radically, radically dangerous. And I think that's what we're seeing with Trump. And I think it's far more dangerous, by the way, than anything that's on the left, because I mean, the left is always going to be a, a bit of an alien force in this country. It's just true. You know, every time in, in my lifetime, anyway, some leftist has been elected, he basically becomes a normal guy. You know, pretty quickly, I mean, this is what happened with Obama. Um, and the most lefty thing he did was institute a Republican form of health care, you know, reform, for example. So I, I don't even, I, you know, Bernie Sanders is an idiot, and I, you know, I laugh at all of his speeches, and, and, and uh, you know, God forbid he ever gets his way, but, but I actually don't feel that he's much of a threat to human liberty. I mean, even elected, I don't believe he's much, much of a threat. Contemporary left is actually rather practical. Uh, but what we've not seen is what Trump represents, which is a kind of a, uh, a, a fascism of, of the right that um, plays into, uh, you know, every kind of um, prejudice of the bourgeoisie. And weaponizes it, centralizes it, and turns into an authoritarian, uh, uh, authoritarian system. Now, so yes, 
this has changed my outlook. I think 2015 represented for me the biggest fundamental change in my sort of political thinking, or I don't want to say, because my politics haven't changed. It's been, it's been my, um, my, my outlook and my, my comprehension, I guess I should say, of the contemporary political world. Uh, so it's been very interesting for me. And in the book I'm discussing tonight, 1944, Omnipotent Government, I have to tell you, it was, it was because of this book that I was, that, uh, that prepared me to see what it is that Trump represents. Um, and I, when I first hear him speak, this is, would have been in Vegas, Las Vegas, I guess uh, June or July or something like that. It was remarkable because I didn't know anything about him. I just knew that he was a kind of a, you know, he was what, you know, what you call a birther or whatever. I just thought he was a little bit of a conspiracy monger, except of a cranky, uh, cranky crony capitalist, you know? I thought, oh, it was some guy running for office, but he was Spanish speaker at Freedom Fest, and I just happened to stumble in the room, sat down, and this is where it got really interesting. I saw Mises' omnipotent government like coming true before me. And I would not have been able to understand this word not having read and absorbed this, this book. I read it many times and absorbed its lessons very intensely. It was because of this book that I was able to see this. And immediately I wrote this article that it ended up in Newsweek. Um, called Donald Trouble's Vashist, I think is what it was called. And it was printed in Newsweek, and then I got on the BBC and the you know, Canadian broadcast system, and I was you know, all over the place. Um, and the first one, really, I think, in, in, in public life to, to name what it is that he represented. And it's because of this book by, uh, by Mises. Maybe just give a little bit of background on this. Oh, before I do, let me say that why it is that I continue to talk about this subject and write about this subject. It's because I don't think that we as a culture understand it well. It's, it's not been part of our experience. It's not been part of our education. Uh, we're all taught that there were these guys called fascists that lived in the 1920s or something like that, you know, Mussolini, Hitler, Franco, Franco, whatever. And, but they were beat in war and the problem of fascism went away and therefore we never have to worry about it again. Uh, so it's always been like data of the past to us. And despite the fact that every public school teacher for 50 years has you know, said, never, for, never forget, you know, let's learn from lessons from history. Well, we don't actually. The only lesson we, we've learned is that some, uh, uh, some uh, bad guys in the past were beat in a world war, and now we don't have to worry about that nonsense anymore. Everybody's a good guy now, especially elected political leaders, and we don't really have to worry about these things. But this is sheer nonsense. Um, fascism was successful for a reason. It was successful because it taps into something that people want out of government. And it taps into, you know, like a very base instinct that we have to long for a controlling force that builds and structures society in a way that serves our interests. By our interests, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, essentially the middle class and uh, the Christian middle class, the, the majority interest. And you know, uh, and, and and that's and 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 we have a candidate that's very aggressive and open about that, and then also opposes the left, which has been on everybody's nerves now for forever. Um, um, you know, so he's openly and aggressively anti-left and anti-PC, right? Yeah, everybody hates PC, right? Oh, finally, some one guy is is telling the truth, you know, about, about the left. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, and seems to otherwise represent the right values. Now, by the right values, I don't mean freedom. Okay? I don't mean liberty. Uh, I don't mean um, a, a commercial society. 
where we all tend to our own business and engage, you know, in, in a gradual creative process of, of, an, of building an emergent order. Uh, uh, Trump does not speak about those things. I mean, the things that he wants to tap into are much more fundamental. They're, they're about, about who you are. Uh, they're about your skin color, your, your face. Um, uh, and, and you know, the, 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 the cultural uh, uh, social values you represent. This kind of stuff is, is what happens in, in the case of uh, where, where you have a society where the cash nexus has failed. You know, in other words, bad economic times. It's, it's a very dangerous thing. Anyway, the reason I keep talking about it is that I don't think we as libertarians, forget the culture at large, I mean, even libertarians are not very well attuned to this. We don't, uh, we don't understand it. We don't recognize it. Um, we, for the most part, tend to see the dangers to the liberty from the left socialists, because that's what we've always understood uh, the dangers to be. And I was thinking about an analogy uh, this morning Let's say you have a school of fish, and we can call these fish the libertarian fish, all right? And, and, and the fisher, fishermen are always using minnows to catch them. And over time, we figured out that, oh, these minnows, if you see a little memo, a, a minnow swimming along <coughs> in a slightly truncated way with a steel thing through his back, there's a very good chance that there's a hook on the end of it, so don't bite it. And so all the, all the, all the, the, the fish in the libertarian school of fish, you know, have figured this out. And, 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 and that minnow is, for us, left socialism. We know not to bite that. That's what we're sensitive about. And we swim around warning everybody, don't bite the minnows with the, with the steel hooks in their back. <laughs> they're, they're pure trouble. And we've learned this lesson so well. It's sort of all we think about. It's all we've talked about. We, 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 we read our, our books about, about the dangers of the left. We, we understand. And we're, we're always annoyed, right? Because we go to college, all of our professors, they left us. We're like, you're an idiot. How can you continue to celebrate this failed, failed uh, experiment in leftist politics? And it's, and it's, it's our core. Um, and we're not alert to, alert to other dangers. So let's say the fisherman suddenly changes the bait. You know, instead of being minnows, it's suddenly uh, salmon eggs, you know. So one day the fish are swimming along, they see a brightly colored red egg with a steel hook in it, and they think, well, at least it's not a memo, minnow, and they're all biting, and they all die, you know. I mean, this is, this is, so they're all caught. And that's pretty much actually the story of what happened to libertarians in interwar Europe. I mean, for that matter, it happened to Mises. I mean, think about this guy, okay? So he, his first great book was 1920. Uh, well, it was, it was really 1919, Nation, State, and Economy, where uh, the dangers were imperialism on one hand and then leftism on the other, socialism. 1922, gigantic book, Socialism. You know, surrounded by communists at the University of Vienna. Uh, the Vienna intellectual scene, for that matter, all over the entire continent was dominated by the, by the left. And this was something he had waged war on, you know, in, in, his, in his writings and his public speakings, and he had proven many, many times what was wrong with the left. And again, like in Europe uh, in, the, in the interwar years, it's just like in the U.S., the petite bourgeoisie were very annoyed about the rise of the left. Uh, socialist Democrats were threatening political order all over Europe, and in France, and in Spain, and Italy, and in Germany, and in Austria, and people were really sick of it. They, they, were, they, 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 they ranged from the you know, relatively peaceful intellectual types, like the Fabian Socialists to the in, in the UK, to the outright violent and dangerous terrorist groups, really, in, in Italy in the interwar years. And a whole crop of politicians rose up in opposition to the extreme left. Many of them came from the left, the cynical left, left, like Mussolini himself, but they reconstituted their ideology. They repackaged it. 
and they took away some aspects of it that uh, that proved to be ridiculously unpopular, like um, the, the resentment against religion. You know, the the atheism of Marx and, and Engels, the attack on 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 property, on on faith, on freely threw that out and came together, came up with a new ideology sort of out of this firmament that was anti-left, that sort of came from that, but it was against the communists and against the left. And it proved to be enormously successful, you know? Um, Mises, you know, was actually shocked by this because, you know, so his, book, uh, his book Socialism comes out in 1922. And, you know, seven years later, uh, the Great Depression hits. It hit just as hard in Europe as it did in the U.S. And now we had the great debate. Has capitalism failed? And of course, he and Hayek got together and, and put together the Austrian Institute for Business Cycle Research to try to persuade people it wasn't capitalism that failed. It was central banking, centralized credit management, and that sort of thing. That was the real problem. What we need to do is restore our money and everything would be fine. But you know what? Everybody ignored them. So, you know, all throughout the 1930s, you, you see a rise of a kind of authoritarianism that was explicitly anti-liberal. This is true in the U.S. to some extent. Explicitly anti-liberal. Capitalism has failed us. So, um, but we still have a state, and somebody needs to manage it. Don't let the communists do it. They'll do to us what they did to Russia. So let us take it over, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, use power in your interest and stop the threats to your well-being from all sides. So Mises found himself caught up in this, okay? Great Depression hits. Uh, suddenly in 1934, 35, something like that, you know, he's looking out his window. I mean, having warned about the rise of the Reds throughout his whole life, he looks out his window from his office and he sees young punks marching around the streets with, uh, 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 with armbands on, they were the brown shirts. And they were celebrating the rise of Hitler, who himself was an Austrian. And there developed in Austria a mass movement to reunite Austria with Germany under Hitler's leadership to restore uh, the greatness of, of imperial Germany past. Uh, with an explicit anti-Semitism, of course. Uh, but and just as <laughs> people always want to talk about the anti-Semitism, it's an important feature of Nazism, but just as important as this anti-liberalism. These people hated laissez-faire, they, they hate man terrestrialism and, 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 and the idea of a commercial society. What they want is centralized management of social order. Uh, the Jews for them uh, were not sort of, you know, just gen, you know, evil genetically or religiously, they're evil because they represent the culmination of the capitalistic ethos. That's why Hitler was able to demonize them and capitalism so, uh, so thoroughly. So Mises realizes he has to get out. So he goes to Geneva. He's there in Geneva for uh, six years, um, has to leave Geneva, comes to the US. He's 60 years old. His whole life is shattered. He has nothing, no books, no papers. He's, he's got to restart his career in a country with a new language that's native. To no job, right? Academic education just basically rescued this guy. It was, it was uh, founded in 1946 and, and uh, gave him a home finally. But the irony is, is very interesting because having warned over a lifetime about the, 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 the fallacies and dangers of left socialism in all of its forms, you know, what is it that profoundly disturbs his own life and career? Um, it was an anti-leftist movement, anti-leftist that was explicitly totalitarian and authoritarian from the right. Now, if you're listening to this, you might you might be saying, "Oh, look! Don't tell me about the right right wing qualities of Hitler. Hitler was fascism is fundamentally leftist." Um, I'm, I'm willing to grant that in the sense that um, you, you know there there is a kind of a left pedigree. But you have to understand the reason fascism succeeds is not because of its left pedigree, but because of its rightist, anti-leftist. It's because of its right-wing values 
that it becomes enormously popular and Hitler was democratically elected, all right? You know, it's true that Germany invaded Austria, but it was also welcomed and cheered when the armies arose. So um, this book, Omnipotent Government, comes out in 1944. Now he's safe in the US, broke, but safe. And he writes this book for Yale University Press. Uh, because it was commissioned, I think, uh, paid for in part by the League of Nations that chipped in to help this guy who's like, didn't have a job, who's like desperately poor. So, so it's a whole book about, the, about Nazism. And it's, I think, the most brilliant book on the topic that there really is, because it's, it's the most thoroughly anti-Nazi book you know, ever written. Not just taking on anti-Semitism. Yes, he does. Mises has very interesting things to say about that. Not just taking on racism, but um, and not just taking on political authoritarianism, but more than that, he takes on the fundamental sort of statist apparatus of Nazism, including its regulatory impositions on private enterprise, its welfare state, and its imperialism. The left can't is not very good at critiquing fascism, actually, because guess why? A lot of what they favor, the fascists do. So that's why you're not going to get a good, thorough, thoroughgoing critique, criticism of fascism from the left. Because fascism is, um, you know, just as well pro-welfare state as anybody on the left. It's just true. I thought it was really interesting. Um, Vox, you know, this this uh, uh, website recently ran a big article asking all these fascist experts whether or not Trump is a fascist, and they all said, no, 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 he's not. He's not actually a fascist, you know because he's not anti-democratic. And it's very interesting, because most of the guys they, had, they talked to, of course, were, were left, left-wing thinkers, and they're, they're afraid to call Trump out for what he is, because once you begin to investigate fascistic ideology, it bears a lot in common with what they actually believe. So it makes them uncomfortable to actually look too closely at this. The well, Mises does look closely at it. When you start the book, you'll be startled to discover um, that Mises does not lead with the subject of racism and anti-Semitism, which is pretty much all anybody thinks Nazism is. Instead, he talks about the real core of Nazism and what gave rise to it, which was, uh, in fact, Liebenstrom. This is trade policy, Hitler's trade policy. What is that policy? The idea was to develop uh, the nation as an independent productive unit that was not dependent upon other nations for uh, cooperative arrangements. Trade brings about peace. You know, the more countries trade with each other, the more they have an incentive to get along with each other. If you're warlike, uh, if you want to develop an authoritarian, unchallenged rule, you need to decouple your nation's economic well-being from its attachments to other nations. So Hitler's imperial policy was, this is according to Mises, right, was not just about the need to dominate others or, or the need to have an empire to, to build up a big military state and everything. There's an open trade element to it. You, Liebentraum is German for breathing room. Germany needs breathing room. We've got to have more people uh, under the uh, uh, umbrella of our political state uh, and, and a, gr a greater range of natural resources in order that Germany, in order to protect the political independence of Germany and the unchallenged power of Hitler. So the leading driving force for national socialist ideology in Germany in the early 1930s was not the evil of the Jews. It was not the uh, glory of the German race. It was the importance of autarky and trade. We have to expand our borders so that we're not dependent upon the US and on the UK for trade, trade, that's the core. That's the core of what represents fascism. I'm, I'm, I would go so far as to say that there is there can be no such thing as fascism that's untied 
from an isolationist trade policy protectionism it's 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 not just a principle it's an indispensable principle and it's probably the core principle so that fateful day in las vegas when i heard trump stand up i, I was, it was it was startling because this was his opening salvo now now this is very strange because We've had very good trade relations. We have no problem. You know, we, we have the World Trade Organization now that Jude Hayden disputes between countries. You know, we've had, you know, NAFTA, you know, integrated trade, integrated with Canada and Mexico. You know, we're trading ever more with China. Uh, tariffs are lower than they've been since World War II. I mean, there are very few trade disputes left in the world. I mean, think about it. Yeah, we have sanctions against Iraq and saying we, we use sanctions far too much. We, meaning the U.S. government, uses sanctions far too much as the end of foreign policy. But for the most part, we don't have trade disputes anymore. Trade's just not an issue. So Trump gets up and screaming at these people, uh, we're being robbed by China. We're being robbed by Mexico. You know, they're taking us for granted. We we're making bad deals with every country in the world, India. I mean, every, every country that we trade with, we're getting robbed with. And his numbers were funny because every time there would be a trade deficit, now do you know what a trade deficit is? I, I'm sure you do, but uh, what it means is, is uh, the, the, the amount that you buy from a, from, a, from a foreign country that they're not similarly buying from you is the difference between those two numbers, that's all. Uh, it's, it's a kind of a fake number in a way because if you have, you know, if, if we buy $200 billion of stuff from China, and they only buy from, from us, you know, 50 billion, that means we have $150 billion trade deficit. It's a meaningless number. I mean, it's, it's uh, um, the, my favorite bar here in town is the Black Bear. I have a gigantic trade deficit with the Black Bear. You know, I'm, you know I'm probably, probably a $1,000 trade deficit. I keep buying from the Black Bear, they're buying nothing from me, okay? So I have a huge trade deficit with them. I was like, it's just, you know, so this number is, is kind of silly. <clears throat> but he stood up and he was saying, China owes us, you know, $3 trillion or whatever it is. And so every trade deficit he would re-render as being money that they owe us. So Mexico owes us. So this was his opening salvo. And he gets, I mean, of course, trade is complicated people. I mean, you know, most people don't know anything about trade, right? I mean, it's like, who trades with Mexico? You and I don't trade with Mexico. And we hardly even notice the origin of of our stuff i mean this this bag that i have right here i mean just maybe that's made in china maybe mexico maybe in india i don't care we're looking at the tag or something it doesn't matter so americans don't have any conception of how important it is to their to their standard of living to their well-being we don't notice or, or carry anything about that really so when some you know bloviating demagogue stands up and says china is robbing us mexico is robbing us india is ro robbing us um, everybody's robbing us in the world. People don't have any kind of intellectual apparatus to say, yeah, but that's not really true. And their first thought was, oh, this guy's a, you know, a wonderful businessman. He knows how to make deals. He says we're making bad deals. We are making bad deals with them. So surely, yeah, you know, he knows. And I, God, I didn't know that. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, I, these political elites are horrible. Of course, they're, 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 they're not making good deals for us. You know, so this is the opening attack, and this is also the opening attack of the, of the Nazis. This is what gave rise uh, to, 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 to uh, Hitlerism in the first place. And, and by the way, a lot of this, you know, might sound a little bit, how would you say, maudlin, because, I mean, the idea that the U.S. has problems anywhere near what Germany had in the 1930s is utterly preposterous, right? I mean, this is a country where their money had completely failed in 1922 and 23. It was like a ridiculous high point of inflation where the money was, you know, became like uh, less, less, uh, less valuable than any other material good. You know, you see these famous pictures of people rolling around um, rice marks in, 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 in wheelbarrows and, and they're being mugged and they dump and the mugger will, will you know, dump out the money and run away with the wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> or the people heating their stoves with, with, uh, with the money, you know, because it was, you know, the only thing you really do with it. So, I mean, that's, and the, and the rise of, 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 uh, of the um, uh, 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 Weimar government, you know, uh, was, uh, you know, led to, you know, unbelievable amounts of corruption. And, and 
Not to mention the fact that the Germany had been beaten in war in World War I and owed you know, the Allied governments under very harsh peace terms uh, a lot of money that people were being taxed to pay you know, a generation later. You, know, you talk about a way of, uh, yeah, this is a good way to annoy people, right? Beat them in a war and then tax them for another 20 years. You know, that's, that, that's not, not smart, but that's, that's what happened. So there's a lot of reasons why Hitler's demonization of the other, of foreign countries, was very effective. I mean, as far as I can tell, this whole, the whole Trump demonization of other countries is completely made up out of nowhere. There's, there's no basis for it whatsoever. But Americans are hysterical people, and, you know, we have a, we have a, a, a lack of, of rationality, I think, when it comes to politics. I mean, never forget, if you think America is a normal country, remember, this is the country where we try to abolish the production and consumption of alcoholic beverages. All right? Just always remember that when you try to think this is a normal country. This ain't a normal country. This is a weird freaking place. All right? We do weird shit like that. So, uh, you know, we're subject to, to, to believing all kinds of nonsense that's not true. So Trump, Trump's able to stand up. And, and does this trade thing. Now, going back a little bit, it's true that we've had other politicians try to make trade central to their campaigns. Uh, Pat Buchanan, a quasi-fascist himself, uh, whose, whose fascism was, was, was mitigated or curbed by probably his religious sensibilities, you know, and his, his Catholicism, and maybe even a hint of of libertarianism thrown in there, uh, absorbed from just being part of the American right-wing movement. But Trump wanted to make, uh, and, and there was before him, uh, Ross Perot, you know, was another one. But, but Trump is new in our time. Nobody had ever done anything like this. And as he spoke, chapter one of omnipotent government just came rushing back to me. I thought, oh God, it's happening, isn't it? This, is, this sounds exactly like Liebenstrom. It's the same thing. Uh, so that was like a big check. All right, check mark. That's done. What's next? Well, what was next was, of course, immigration. Um, that was the famous speech uh, where he said, uh, the Mexicans are coming here, they're murderers, they're rapists, and I'm sure there's some nice people among them. Right? That was that famous speech. And it, it got everybody whipped up into a frenzy. A questioner stood up. He was a Mexican man. He said, Senor, uh, you know, uh, Trump, uh, you know, had a question. And Trump interrupted him and said, wait a minute, sir, are you from, are you being, did you, were you sent here by the Mexican government? I mean, he's like, he wouldn't even answer, would let him ask his question. He kept in, and it was amazing because, you know, you talk about somebody, another issue made up out of whole cloth. You can look at polls dating back 15 or 20 years and show attitudes at least up to the summer of 2015 towards immigration among average people has been more favorable than ever. We have no immigration problems in this country. We have an illegal immigration problem because we don't allow enough legal immigration that, of course, same thing with pot and marijuana and everything else. People are going to do it anyway. They're going to do it illegally. So that's, that's the only problem. But that's, that's not, not actually a problem for this country. This country benefits Im immensely from its, from its immigrant population and always has. And you know, it wasn't even a populist issue. So he's like making up something. So he's giving this crowd of people all sorts of fake, phony reasons, excuses for why they're suffering. Why are you suffering? You're suffering because of China and Mexico and our trade policies where we're making bad deals. And also we've got a lot of very foreign, strangely dangerous people invading us. So that was, was amazing. Those are the first two things. And, and Mises covers this too. So. Leave Trump's first have to have to create a big state, invade other countries to uh, to create a a, 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 a na national economy that is independent of foreigners so they can't control us. And then we need to unite the polit the the uh, unite the people uh, based on on language, on religion, and on race. This is why racism becomes an important part of fascism. It's not really about racism as an ideology. It's really about trying to find some basis 
uh, to uh, to get people to rally around you, to find identity among each other, uh, so they can rally and support the authoritarian dictator. Uh, the speech went on, and then it just became, you know, uh, comical. Uh, comical if it weren't so serious. Um, again, not about cutting government. Every other Republican says, "I'm going to cut the government because they're always lying." But at least they say it, right? Not this guy. He doesn't talk about cuts in government. He doesn't talk about the glory of free enterprise. The words freedom and liberty never cross his lips. He doesn't think government's too big. What he thinks is that we need a better competent people to manage the current apparatus because everybody else is stupid and he's the one smart person. So that was it, right? I mean, because I had read this book, From to Government, I saw this unfolding uh, before my eyes and it was really obvious and that's why I called him out very early on. In the course of doing it, of course, you have to re-explain what fascism is, since it's not just a curse word. It's not just some uh, uh, bad name that you call somebody you don't like. It's a specific ideology that is probably the most successful ideology in the history of modern politics. Far more successful than left socialism because it's been tried in many other places always leading to egregious results. Um, okay, but we as libertarians are disinclined to recognize this because we're not well-schooled in it, we don't understand it, and it's not part of our history to be alert to the dangers of fascism. So we tend to overlook it. And this is what it's, this has been, this has been the story of the rest of 2015. I mean, it's tedious reading about Trump because people don't get that he represents something coherent. They're like, well, gosh, you know, he's kind of a bad guy. You know, look, his policies are not so good. I mean, some of them are good. You know, his tax cuts seem okay, you know. Uh, but look, he used him in a domain. And, you know, it's just like floundering all over the place, not, not recognizing the fact that this guy actually represents a coherent ideological system. And, and it's, not, it's, it's not a mystery anymore once, 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 you, once you recognize it. But let's ask a fundamental question, because I mean, Mises talks about this, you know, the failure of the German economy is what led people to cast off their belief in and hope for economic structures as a way out of human suffering. Laissez-faire is rejected. Commercial society, down with it. Uh, the cash has failed us. The cash nexus has failed us. Um, uh, the financial markets are a racket. You know, the, the big money center banks are run by, uh, by Jews who don't have the best interests of the masses at heart. You know, this is the line in Germany. So how does this, how does this port over to our current times. And I must say, I've, under, I've underestimated, and I bet you have too, just how incredibly powerful the leftist narrative about 2008 really has been. You know, 2008 was, was kind of our version of, of, the, of, the, of the failure, of the, of the Weimar inflation of, of 1922 and 1923 in Germany. Why? <clears throat> because a bedrock principle of American economic life turned out to be a lie. Think about it. For, for the good part of the 20th century, all Americans believed that there was one fundamental investment that was integral to their whole lives that signified achievement of the American dream. There was one thing that you could always believe in without fail, and all smart money knew it, and all smart people knew it, and that was housing. And this is where people put their savings. To own a house was to have arrived. House is where you live. It's, it represents your identity, it's, it's your neighborhood, it's, it's the very core of American life. And like practically overnight, um, people found that they were paying more for their houses than they could ever get in, I mean, on their mortgages than they could ever get back if they sold the house. I mean, think about it. 
for a vast number of Americans, if not a majority of Americans, they would have been better off bailing out on their houses, uh, having it confiscated by the bank and rebuying it again at a lower price and paying a much lower mortgage. And that's how underwater things were. And it all happened like in a flash um, between, you know, I guess the, it became very visible for, or visible in the summer of 2007, winter of 2007. And a year later, when uh, everything was in complete upheaval and people were convinced that the entire world was falling apart. It wasn't just about falling house prices and it wasn't just about underwater mortgages. But remember, the elites were the ones that were holding all this bad, bad debt, the mortgage-backed securities, you know, the collateralized you know, debt obligations, these, uh, these synthetic collateralized debt obligations and all these fancy financial things. Who was holding this? It was all the, the elite money centers, right? They needed a bailout. They wanted 400 billion, then they wanted another trillion, then they wanted another trillion. In the end, it was about $4 trillion that, had to be, that was being used to bail out uh, these bad investments in 2008 through 2000, you know, whatever, 2012, I guess, is when, the, when it finally came to an end. It hasn't entirely come to an end. Uh, so how did they achieve this? Now, this is a transition time. Bush was on his way out. He's a little bit of a lame duck. He was on his way out of office. Uh, the election took place, Obama was elected, he was coming back into the office. So you had two administrations involved in this gigantic scam. How are you going to get a, a, a spending, spending package of $400 billion to pass Congress in a time when there's no money whatsoever? You have to incite panic. And that's what Bush did. And Obama picked up, picked up on it after Bush. They incited panic. If you don't pass this, we're going to be Iceland. There's not going to be any groceries on the shelves. You're going to go to your ATM, use your card. There's not going to be any cash. Your bank's probably going to close. Uh, everything that you love is going to, going to collapse. Your credit card's going to stop working. Uh, just like your house is suddenly seemingly worthless, this is going to happen to your whole life unless you back this bailout. So what is the message that the American people got? The American, the American people got the message that our system of economics has failed us. And what is our system? Popularly known as capitalism. And that's the message. Yes, it's a stupid message, it's a dumb message. It's a very simple message, it's something that people can understand. The left seized on it, and it was their moment. I mean, we had our collapse of socialism in 1989 and 1990, we were like, ha your stupid system fell apart, free enterprises won. 2008, they got retribution and said, look, um, your stupid system called free enterprise, capitalism, whatever you want to call it, is completely failed. Uh, it, and it's proven itself just to be a gigantic insider racket where, where the elites pillage us and then, and then pillage us again to get bailed out from their, from their heirs. Uh, and that was the message we were left with. And I'm so sorry to say this, but we, here we are seven years later, and I think that's still the message that people have taken from it. That's the ideological message, and it's taken me personally a long time to understand just how powerful this is. And it's true, there are a lot of great studies. I linked to one the other day. You should see it at the fee.org <coughs> fee website by um, uh, Stephen Horowitz and, and Peter Betke on, um, on the real reason for the housing, housing collapse. And the, the reason for the housing collapse is the housing boom. I mean, you can't explain a, a bust without explaining the boom. So you have to explain the boom. Why did the boom come about? It's because throughout 2008, uh, the, the, the first decade of the, two, of, uh, the 21st century, the um, uh, money was too loose. I mean, interest rates were driven down to zero, cash was being flooded in the economy, all tracing back again to 2001 uh, at 9-11. You know, after the terrorist attacks, Bush was like, um, we will never let uh, the economy, uh, American economy fail. You know, the Fed is, you know, cue the Fed, make this economy great again, you know? And how, they, how do you do that? By printing money. Printing money led to a rid of absurd, 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 absurd uh, uh, housing boom like we'd never seen before. I mean, already housing was like outlandish, even ten years before the bust. I mean, it was it was already in a bubble-like conditions. But but what happened in the two thousands was just it was just just outlandish. New money always lands somewhere. It it, it landed in these new and in, in, uh, on the one hand for the bourgeoisie, ever more uh, houses. But uh, for, the, for the financial markets, it was these new fancy 
uh, securitized um, mortgage packages that made no distinction among uh, risk. And why was that? Well, because those were backed in a very hazardous uh, situation by by federal uh, agencies like Fannie Mae and Fannie Mac. So that's um, that's what went on. But I, I think I've been slow to understand just how powerful this narrative uh, has been. So it's led to a kind of alienation of the middle class in this country from the economic system uh, that we have. Uh, Obama made things worse with Obamacare, which has just been just a calamity for for something. What, what's what, you know? You think about American lifestyle, and you know what represents you know security, your houses and your health care, right? So fail, fail, all at once. I mean, we're, these are the conditions that give rise to fascism, my friends. This is this is this is what it is. The things you believe in have 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 failed for you. So now, what do you resort to? We, you, you go, you dig deeper. You get you get to more fundamental stuff like, like race and religion, and all it took was this one guy to come along and just throw a little match on this on this on this on this gas, and and we're seeing it explode. Um, if you want to understand something about just how disgruntled the middle class is in this country, um, look at. Uh, some of the data you can Google it, and I don't want to. I don't want to do that uh, right right now. But um, suicide rates and alcoholism among uh, uh, middle-aged white people in this country are uh, unprecedentedly high, and and stand in defiance of every single other demographic trend. Uh, demographers who have looked at this most recently, in the, the recent Nobel Prize laureate in economics, have uh, called it. Uh, you know, startling. Uh, he's never seen another uh, case in, in decades, if not in, this, in a century, where one pocket of the population has declining demographics, like, like um, ever shorter lives in the midst of, uh, of booming prosperity uh, because of the despair that they felt. You know, there was so much sadness and job loss after 2008. You look at the workforce numbers, uh, you know they're they're really falling. I mean the labor the labor force in this country is 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 falling. Like with every time the unemployment numbers come out, there are fewer people who the unemployment numbers are are not high, but they're 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 built off the people who are actually seeking work from the uh, labor from the existing labor force. But the labor force itself is shrinking dramatically, meaning people are giving up. And getting jobs, so we do have a kind of a slow burn panic. Again, this is not Weimar Germany, all right? Uh, there's no excuse, but uh, Americans are very sensitive people. We have um, very spoiled, you know, and uh, we we panic at the slightest signs of trouble, and the signs of trouble are all around us. Let me just say a, a couple of words about. Um, anti-Semitism of, of, of Germany as, as Mises describes it. Now this guy is, it's this awesome. His whole section here on racism needs to be read and read again. Uh, because we, this word racism is th it's thrown around all over the time in this country. I mean, you've been called a racist, I've been called, everybody's called a racist for whatever stupid reason, you know. Uh, racism, like fascism, is a real ideology. It's not just you know a dislike uh, about or, you know to be around uh, people of other races. That's not it at all. That's just a personal preference, and maybe based in racism. Most likely, it's just I don't know. People are assholes. What can I say? So, uh, but racism as an ideology is something different. It really is the construction construction of a narrative around which racial identity assumes a central role in the determination of big historical events. The reason why such and such happened is because of race. Uh, and that this and the racial considerations trump every other condition. That's, that's, that's racism as, as, an, as an ideology. And typically racism tries to seek a kind of an explanation for these things um, in, in biology and you get a lot of crank science and that sort of thing. And there's plenty of that around the Nazis. But Mises is, is awesome, actually. Mises does not want to call discrimination racism. And he's speaking now as a Jew. And he, he says in this passage here, he says, look, 
If Germans don't want to deal with Jewish shopkeepers, that's their ride. Yeah, their loss. Uh, the competitive markets will tend to integrate people, uh, but it also protects people's rights to refuse to do business with those whom they have no uh, uh, interest in dealing with, even, even if it's for bigoted reasons. Visa says that's a human right to behave in a bigoted manner, and a free society must protect the right to choose. If you don't, uh, then you're no longer free. Um, he says, with well, the problem of the German, German anti-Semitism with the laws uh, that began to discriminate against uh, Jews, um, that's where you, you leave the realm of uh, laissez-faire and enter into, into central planning. And anti-Semitism became this kind of, um, uh, just f f in Mises' understanding, another way of attacking the liberal society. Uh, because it's through anti-Semitism that the Nazis were able to kind of uh, intensify uh, the public's hatred and suspicion of, of uh, the capitalistic uh, 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 classes. And I think to some extent Trump is doing the same thing. The analogies are not perfect, but I think his racism, uh, which I, I find you know, very obvious to me as I listen to him, uh, oh my God, yes, very much so. Um, does smack of this kind of like genuine ideological racism, not just uh, you know dislike of, of 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 people of different races. I mean, it's it's a it's a he's encouraging a kind of a uh, a narrative of history, whether it's whether it's an attack on Islam or Mexicans or or whomever. Um, it's very much part of his fascistic worldview. So read, read what Mises has to say about German anti-Semitism, you know, which comes along very late, actually. Yes, it's always been an embedded part of, of Hitler's view of the world. I mean, you can read that in Mein Kampf, obviously. This is just, if you ever read Mein Kampf, you, you should, actually, because it's, you find that it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy brilliant, in a sense. Um, it's very crankish. Uh, reckless uh, history that that uh, you know tries to demonize uh, capitalism and Jewry um, and non-Aryans, uh, you know, for for having wrecked uh, a German life. Essentially, you know, that's it's and and I, I've never been able to find a word in my cough about you know about the coming Holocaust. Okay, so you guys, contrary to what you might have heard, it's it's not actually in there. <laughs> what you get is very run of the mill anti-Semitism that you can read from a thousand different right-wing tracks that are currently being sold at Amazon.com right now, all right? So it's, it's not actually as, as, as uh, uh, weird and demonic as you might think. Anyway, um, that, that has got to conclude my lecture about uh, omnipotent government. My point is, in summary, that Mises learned something very, very powerful. There are other enemies to liberty besides the, the left. Uh, there's a much more powerful and potent enemy on the right um, I was recently having a discussion with with um, um, my uh, my good friend at, at Fee, um, Dan Klein, uh, not Dan Klein, uh, but um, editor of anything peaceful. I'm so sorry; it's just so flaky that I've forgotten this. But anyway, he said that the right is much more dangerous than the left because the right tends to throw out whatever liberal elements are in left leftist ideology and just dispense with them completely. And lo and behold, I found that same insight in Rudolf de Serfdom. Hayek says this too. He's speaking about British socialism. He says the right is much more dangerous than the left because at least the left has some persistent belief in civil liberties and democracy as an institution. And, and uh, you know, so the, the belief in choice, at least, I mean, he's not talking about Russian style, uh, red socialism, but the, the left socialism of the Fabian, it's Western variety, at least has some elements of liberalism. The right throws out even those. So they don't believe in free enterprise, but neither do they believe in democracy once they've taken control. And they don't believe in civil liberties. Um, it's just raw, outrageous uh, authoritarianism through and through. That may be true. Anyway, I think it's about time that libertarians get hip to this and start to take it seriously and stop treating Trump as a delightful uh, comic who's giving the political class trouble. And oh, isn't that just funny and wonderful? 
is making a mess of the two-party system, making a mess of the Republicans and, and scaring the establishment. Ha ha, isn't this, isn't this great? Not so much, my friends. Um, God willing, will, uh, he'll never take power. But uh, even if he doesn't take power, there's, there's going to be another Trump. There'll be another one after him. Our, we live in dangerous times in politics. Very good times in economics and technology, but very dangerous in politics. And I think the way to understand this is to uh, maybe perhaps get your head out of uh, 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 you know the the red scare literature of the of the of the of the nineteen teens and nineteen twenties or the Cold War and start reading very seriously about the history of um, fascistic ideology in the twentieth century and how it's it's ported itself over into the twenty first century. It's been a big revelation for me this year. Thank you for letting me have time for sharing it with you. To me, why do we read books? You know, why do we dig through these old things? To help us understand, to get a lens through which to see our current world in a way that allows us to have a perceptive power that goes beyond the superficial. That's why we read books. If it weren't for Mises's omnipotent government that gave me a, a really good perspective and a guide to understanding what fascism is, I would not have seen what I see. So I encourage you to read it. It's available on liberty.me. Uh, enjoy yourself. It's a terrifying book. And thank you, my friends. Hey, let's have a wonderful 2016. And let's renew our, 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 our optimistic uh, love of liberty. This has been a very dark hour we've spent together. I'm sorry about that. I do believe that we're going to prevail in long runs. Maybe uh, it's not going to be a purely linear climb, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll get there. I do think that liberty is going to triumph in the end. Let's do everything we can this next year to, to help it along, shall we? Thank you, my friends, and I look forward to seeing you next week. All the best to you.